to do that now. My, my apologies. So we missed recording all that part, but okay. Okay, so, uh, you know, the convention is an important uh, process for our party. It's, it's the fullest form of democracy and democratic discussion. So these, these debates are meaningful. Can I, can I ask other people to mute themselves, please? Okay. Can I ask other, can I ask everyone else to mute themselves, please? I'm hearing some other noise in the background. Uh, this might be Comrade Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, okay. So now, um, uh, the I, I want to talk to you a little bit about just the logistics of what happens between now and the party convention. We have the discussion and the debate about the 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 draft document. That's the main document that we'll be discussing. But the between now and the convention, all of the various party members are entitled to uh, submit uh, their remarks to the pre-convention discussion bulletin. Um, and those are those will be published, as many of them as is necessary to, to just to transmit all the submissions that are received so that everyone in the party can, can talk to everyone else at the, in the party during this time about what they think are the most important political issues. Now, just out of, you know, from the logistical necessity, um, the the uh, submissions for the convention bulletin are restricted to 800 words. So people do have to think about it and be concise. And it's also, you know, a, an appeal has been made that when we're sending in um, submissions and discussions about the, about the documents, then we're not, we're not debating, like we're not going to get into worrying about grammatical niceties or correcting the, the, the grammar or the punctuation or, you know, very specific wording. This is not intended for as a copy editing exercise, but as a real political exercise. But what we really want to grasp and get into is the, is the contents of the politics. So uh, in each region of the country, there will, be, there will be other regional or provincial conventions to, for the purpose of, of passing resolutions and electing delegates to the central convention. Ours in Alberta is going to be held on June 5th. Uh, and th at that point, we hopefully will have had several more sessions for, for, of this uh, pre-convention discussion. People, everyone will have had an opportunity to read and discuss and to submit written resolutions. So the resolutions that go forward to the party convention, the priority is given to those that come from provincial or regional nominating meetings or from party clubs. So individuals who want to submit resolutions are expected to do it through their club or through one of those nominating conventions. That way we know that, you know, the resolutions coming in are gonna be in, in a certain sense filtered that they have at least some degree of, uh, of general support. It's not, you know, not just one person. It's not that the fastest typer <laughs> gets to send in the most resolutions. So. Um, and um, another aspect is that the, all of the expenses of, send, of the delegates are borne by the central party and by the, the regional or provincial parties. That is, the, their um, travel expenses, their registrations are all paid collectively. So those who are elected as delegates are not being selected by their own individual ability to pay, but are being selected on a political basis by their comrades but who, think, who they think would best represent them. Um, okay. So what I wanted to talk about uh, now actually is to, to actually get into some of the content of the uh, what's in the document, the political draft document. As I said, it's, we can't, cut, we can't um, foresee every detail of what will happen in the political life of the country for over the next three years. So this is broad and general, but we can foresee certain broad general uh, political trends and uh, you know, discuss as um, to the fullest our plans about how we're gonna meet those challenges. So the, you know, the document begins by indicating you know, the seriousness of, of the challenges that are facing us, the, the seriousness of the, 
of the political situation, both in Canada and throughout the world. But there are a number of, of interweaving crises that are making life difficult for working people and that, you know, that um, pose real political dangers. The, the climate, the, you know, the problem of climate change, the increasing problems of, of urgency of dealing with climate change, the pandemic, uh, an economic crisis, the rise of right-wing uh, movements and you know, increasingly belligerent uh, and sometimes violent right-wing movements up to and including some you know, fascistic and, and neo-Nazi groups in some parts of the world, and the rise of militarism, the increasing threat, the, the, the increasing reality as well as the threat of war. Um, and these are, these are all interrelated crises. Uh, the document talks about each one of them and all of them, but what I wanna talk about is you know, to take a little bit of a step back and try to talk in a little bit more abstract terms about how all of these problems are really interrelated. We actually know that <clears throat> the, the climate crisis is a, you know, is, is a human created crisis. It arises out of the, the um, industrial processes that are part and parcel of the capitalist system. So she, we're just burning too much stuff. Um, the, but the, you know, the, the pandemic is not unrelated to this crisis of the, of the, the climate. Um, you know, scientists, scientists, various kinds of scientists in the you know, different fields of biological research have been warning for a long time that pandemics are coming, new diseases are coming, because of the in, you know, the more intensified interaction of humanity with the um, uh, remaining reserves of, of wilderness and the changes in climate providing more of a uh, more living space for, for novel organisms. It's not, it is not a surprise that a pandemic has occurred. They couldn't predict exactly which, um, which virus it would be, but that there would be pandemics is, is not a surprise. But we even know that you know, the American government had said under uh, the previous regime had set up a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, an office to deal with pandemic planning and then uh, Donald Trump had that uh, office closed down at the beginning of his term just in time for the for the coronavirus pandemic but besides the the you know this the natural environment and you know the problems of our interaction with nature there's there's op the overall economic crisis of capitalism it's nothing new there are cyclical crises of capitalism, which are increasing in, in severity and, and intensity over time because of the structural crises of capitalism. Capitalism just doesn't really work all that well. And it's reached the limit of, of, of growth where it can grow its way out of some of these uh, economic crises. Of course, the, the pandemic did not create the crisis, but it exacerbated the crisis. It made it that much worse. And it's very clear that capitalism does not have the tools to deal with these crises. It does, it does not appear to be moving on the crisis of uh, the climate and then you know, the, with the swiftness or the decisiveness that's needed to retool the economy away from uh, fossil fuels. It does not have the tools to deal with the public health crisis of the pandemic and it does not have the economic tools to deal with the, with the economic impact of the pandemic. Uh, in the course of this, you know, this pandemic, uh, economic inequality has increased because government, government bailouts have taken the form of a great deal more money being siphoned off towards corporations rather than towards the sustaining the buying power of ordinary working people. And this, this, can only, this can only increase the, the uh, seriousness of the economic crisis and make it harder on people, on working people, on everybody. And related to that, I think, is the rise of these of far-right groups and 
even neo neo fascist neo nazi groups because these far right groups are a sign of people's lack of faith in the system their their fear and feeling of insecurity their lack of confidence in the in the future of of, of capitalism or their own future now of course the the uh, the far right groups have come up with a uh, a, a storyline about the nature of the world is which is just completely obscurantist, completely uh, devoid of of, re, of re, realism, and which is very very dangerous because they turn they turn this feeling of insecurity and this. Um, loss of confidence in the in the institutions of bourgeois society not against the bourgeoisie or against the capitalist system which has created the problem but use using it to divide and um, sow hatred and mistrust amongst working working class people around the world both internally within each country and internationally and so it's not unrelated to the rise of militarism and war propaganda as well um, so a lot, you know, like uh, the first part of the document that we have deals with the, with the the crisis of the war in the Ukraine and something of the historical background of that. But and of course, this is this is something which is of great importance to us. Like our party, it just naturally any communist party in the world is has to respond to uh, a war or the danger of war, you know with a greatly increased attention to the to the fight to build the peace movement to counteract war and war propaganda and oh this is not just because war is bad it's, this is not just out of a you know basic human impulse of of the horror of you know of how people suffer in a war and how bad war is for for um human beings for the climate it's also the case that war, unfortunately, is good for capitalism and war is bad for socialism. And the existence of, of uh, you know, every time capitalism can successfully create a war, this is a real setback to the working class movement within the, within the countries that are at war, but also internationally. Because the, the, the rise of militarism, militarism also, you know, includes the rise of of war propaganda, we've seen we've seen that in Canada now, like just a tsunami of, uh, you know, hysterical uh, propaganda, uh, essentially demonizing Russia and and trying to turn the the neo fascist <laughs> elements of Ukraine into some kind of heroes of democracy, but it's. It's not just that you know. It's not just the war is bad for the Ukraine, or that the war is bad for Russia. The war is also bad for Canada. The it's not just the loss of uh, the of the resources that could be spent on social programs and on mitigating climate change, which are now being poured into military spending it instead. Although those are very serious problems, those are definitely non-trivial problems. But it's also this ideological assault of pitting one nationality against each other, of trying to depict to the world to a, a kind of um, comic book, cartoonish um, image of the world of good guys and bad guys um, with, you know, where nationalities or countries are depicted as the good guys or the bad guys. Our party doesn't stand on the side of Russia our, our party doesn't stand on the side of Ukraine. Our party stands on the side of the Ukrainian working class and the Russian working class. And it's in the interests of neither of those countries, of neither of those uh, working class contingents for their countries to be at war. And it is not in the interests of the working class in Canada to be swept up in this kind of war propaganda and xenophobia and this uh, 
this propaganda which justifies increased spending on militarism, increased um, belligerence in foreign policy around the world, not just in the Ukraine and Russia, but against all kinds of countries who may have um, their own domestic economic policies, which are at variance with the economic interests of, of the multinational corporations that the capitalist government serve. So for, it, for all these reasons, war is, is a very dangerous and a very difficult thing for socialists in any country. And it has got to be one of our primary goals to fight against war propaganda, to counteract war propaganda, and to build up the forces of the peace movement as much as possible. So it's very important for us to have an understanding as well of uh, how we should approach this question, like which, which questions we should bring forward in our own counter propaganda. What is going to have the most impact in bringing unity amongst the forces that are in favor of peace and making them most effective in counteracting war propaganda. And so we have had several party meetings, several cross-country meetings on Zoom, you know, to discuss this question, one of them just last weekend. And it's, you know, this point really needs to be emphasized is that it, it's not our job to glorify Russia or demonize Russia. It's not our job to glorify Ukraine or demonize Ukraine. It's our job to point out the, you know, the the what's wrong with the NATO and the belligerence and aggressiveness of the imperial powers, which our own capitalist government is a part of, and the alliances that our own capitalist government is, is part of. Our job is to fight against our own militarists and to overcome our own the, the militarism with our, within our own country. And so we can hopefully, we can make common cause with people who may have differing views about the actual nature of Russia and the actual nature of the Ukraine, as long as we can agree upon a central point is that the, the solution to the problem has to be a negotiated peaceful settlement, that the, the problem will not, the crisis will not be solved by more and more, and that future crises like these will not be solved by pouring more and more money and resources into armaments and, take, and um, military alliances but by promoting the development of peaceful, uh, mutually respectful relations between countries and making use of diplomatic uh, resources to resolve any potential future disputes or antagonisms or rivalries. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't wanna go on a great length. I'm not going to go through the whole document. I, I hope people have had a chance to do some reading and that uh, you know, that I would now like to throw it open for some general discussion about and the, you know, the more general sort of points that I've made, but also like specifically what's in the, the first sections of this document, which talk about the international situation and the, the, um, the crises and, and serious problems that we're facing. So I just like to then throw it open for discussion. So I see Jeremy already has his hand up. Go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for that uh, that overview, um, Naomi. Um, uh, one kind of area, like, sorry, two kind of areas that really drew me in this first section were um, my thoughts around um, in line 53, when it, it, that's talking about the climate crisis, um, there is um, there is a resolution in there to talk about, we need to build more electric cars, free public transit, um, build publicly owned intermittent transit, retool car plants, build trains and other sustainable transportation. Um, but I, I do think we, we do um, really target the industry a lot, um, we, but we don't look, um, the, the assessment that's, that's provided in the climate crisis isn't looking at um, urban and uh, rural transportation um, for, for public transit. So I'd, it would be interesting to see um, a resolution that would, that would include that assessment where we're, we're looking at the infrastructure of public transportation across like just uh, rural areas of Canada and um, um, areas of um, just in, in, in cities too of, of how there's a lack of um, accessible and affordable transportation. Um, and the other area that drew me in this first document was uh, first half of it was um, in line 36. Um, I, th I think we need to have um, more of an analysis of migrant workers and temporary foreign worker programs in uh, Canada. 
um, looking um, particularly in Alberta in the car, uh, Carl meatpacking plants where there was um, a substantially more uh, larger um, amount of uh, workers there who were migrant workers um, and had a successful participation in un union drive with uh, uh, um, UCW, I think, um, the union there. So um, yeah, those two areas I, I just noticed in the first half that maybe need more um, analysis and observation in. Thanks. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, was, I was still muted. Okay, so I'm just uh, inviting, is there anybody else? If you want to either put your hand up, use the, the raise hand function, or if you also, if you, you could just put your name in, in the chat and then we could call on you to speak. Okay, so I see Corrine has her hand up. Go ahead, Corrine. One point of clarification was they use the word supranatural, and I don't know if that is interchangeable with transnational. Supra. Or supra um, national, yeah, yeah supra national, or does it have a different meaning? That um, it's a little unclear to me. Am I? I think I'll make a note of where that was. Do you do, do you see Page, a specific? It's on eighty four. No, sorry, wrong one. Wrong one. I think you could probably, for for rough and ready purposes, kind of assume that supranational and it, tra multinational or transnational corporation essentially would mean the same thing. So yeah, no, it talks about supranational tr national trade on one fifty four. So it says uh, solidarity against transnational corporations and supranational trade and financial bodies such as the World Trade Organization and the World Bank. Yeah. Um, just, I'm not really sure what the definition of that word would be. Yeah, well, yeah, essentially, I think it's, they're just in using it as a sort of more technical way of saying it's not just the, the corporations themselves, but the sort of the, the global infrastructure that they have created for, you know, for globalization and international trade. You know, like the, the the World Bank and and various trade, um, uh, you know, various uh, international trade agreements and so on. The the, the kind of uh, over you know the o the overarching set of institutions that they've created for international trade, which you know, th which in some ways they're attempting to make those stand above national governments. So, So, so there are, you know, I mean, there are there's a couple of different kinds of things. I mean, there are legitimate international, multinational or global agreements, you know, like there's rules about how you can use the 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 um, resources of the of the open oceans and so on. And things like rules of, you know, like if if you know treaties that would say, you know, like no no weapons in space and things like that. There's you know legitimate um global agreements but there's also these trade agreements which are much more tailored towards serving the interests of the multinational corporations and is there those are not the only kind of trade agreement there could be so we're, we're being critical about a specific form of agreement not you know this is not saying anything about international agreements generally so okay so I see somebody, there's a hand up for the Ukrainian center. So I'm not sure who it is who, would, who wanted to speak there. Uh, yes, Chris would like to speak. Yeah, yeah, I have a couple of points. We can go one at a time so that you can go to other people. But um, the first point I have is uh, I'm generally in agreement about the need to focus on what we can control specifically around NATO. But I've sort of prepared sort of a little comment about um, my thing. Sorry if it's a little lengthy, but. Um, uh, while we've made sure to point out the illegality of Rus the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we should be cautious about placing the blame as a singular result of NATO's imperialism. I worry that this focus on NATO alone could be misconstrued as support for Russian aggression. An addition should be made to clarify that while the position of the Russian Federation 
is deeply influenced by NATO's imperialism, it is simultaneously being colored by the nascent imperialism of the Russian Federation, which is being built up by Putin's government in reaction to the worsening conditions of re Russia resulting from the fall of the USSR, the complete restoration of capitalism <clears throat> in the former Soviet republics and the submissive position that Putin's predecessors had taken towards America and NATO's centered imperialism after the fall of the USSR. While NATO's expansionist policies have certainly pushed the escalation of this conflict, we must not allow ourselves to confuse Putin's chauvinistic ambitions of a great Russia with the genuine anti-imperialist struggle. Russia, while weaker than it once was, is still a nuclear power that actively imposes its will upon its neighbors for the benefits of its own bourgeoisie. Our allies in this conflict are neither NATO, Ukraine, or the Russian Federation, but rather the working and oppressed peoples of the world whose lives and livelihoods will be caught in the crossfire of the wars waged by the ruling classes of the world. That's sort of the point I wanted to make on the, uh, the Russia issue. You can continue, Chris, if you like, to um, feel more points. Uh, that was just kind of summing it up. I, I agree with the whole of everything in there. Ta I think it's excellent for us to be focusing on how NATO has kind of been pushing this along, but I, I, I worry that, especially given a lot of the narrative here right now about, like you see in the media all the time, Russia being still called communist and stuff, by not putting any blame beyond just a single line saying what Russia did is illegal, I worry that we open ourselves up to being included in criticisms of Putin where we're not supportive of Putin, we're not supportive of the current government in Russia, we're against the war, and I just think it would be good to have an addition in there that really pushes that in there as well. That pushes? That Russia is not a victim as much as it's its own imperialist power of trying to become in its own way. Well, there's people that well, Martin, Martin, you'd like to speak now? Well, just to follow up what he said, there's people who don't believe that Russia's done anything illegal because they've um, recognized Donetsk and, and the other area there as separate from Ukraine. And they've signed a security treaty with them, just the same way that China signed the uh, security treaty with that, uh, was it Tonga? I remember those islands there on the, in the uh, Pacific. So, you know, under that arrangement, it's not necessarily illegal that they want in there. So, uh, like she was saying, it might be better not to say anything bad about Russia because. Everybody's got their, their different opinion. So. May I speak, Naomi? Just on that? Okay, yes. I, 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 I think Chris makes a fair point. I, like I noticed on, our, on paragraph number eight, it says that imperialism has never let, nevertheless cast the war in Ukraine as a struggle between Russian communism and Western democracy, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that's quite right. I don't think it's been characterized as a as Russia being communist, I would prefer a change in wording there to Soviet revanchism or something like that. So, so that's something like what Chris is saying, but, but further to Chris's point, I think we should have somewhere in this section, we should characterize what we think Russia is, you know, or make it clear that we think it's a, it's a, that it is a capitalist state, a bourgeois state, a nascent imperialist or a, a, a sub imperialist state. I think those are good ideas. But isn't that just your opinion, though? Well, there are economic there are economic uh, determinations which which tell us what is an imperialist state based on the level of monopoly capitalism. Is is a, is a country privatized? You know, what level of privatization of the economy is there? So Russia is objectively a capitalist state. The question is whether it rises to the imperialist level, the monopoly capitalist level. That is definitely an open question. And, people that can argue on both sides. But I mean, every country in the world, except maybe North Korea is a capitalist country. China's capitalist. Well, it depends on the level of public ownership of the economy. It depends on the character of the state. So uh, it, is it, we say that Vietnam is socialist. China is, we can argue on that. Vietnam is socialist. Laos is socialist. Cuba is socialist. 
DPRK is socialist. Does it really matter? Well, it does matter. How? Because uh, we are fighting for socialism here in Canada. Yeah, yeah but you, you, you don't just jump over the one line and all of a sudden you're socialist. You move towards that. And it takes a long time to get there. But the big step, yeah, this is a lot that we were getting into maybe a tangential discussion, which is very yeah. good. Well, but yeah, if, if, if I can jump in here, I'm going to say this conversation is probably taking place <laughs> at every party meeting across the country. And, you know, because the issue is, you know, like we really do have to grapple with these issues about uh, what's going on there. What kind of war is it? What are these? What kind of countries are these? Like we have to try to understand the world. But even more important, well, we have to remember, we have to keep track of the fact that our job is not to, um, you know, is not to separate ourselves from every other, uh, you know, peace loving force by pointing out how we see things differently. Our job is to unite the peace forces, is to find the common ground that we can agree upon. And I think it's, you know, there's going to come a point where we're, we're going to have to say that strategically, Politically, our job is not to correctly characterize Russia, but to make the case that Canada should not be involved in war preparations, Canada should not be involved in war, and Canada should not be, should not be supporting, um, you know, should not be sending armaments and, and war material to the Ukraine. Our job is to criticize the Canadian government, to find common grounds with other, you know, peace forces, within Canada to work on that, to build up those, that, that unified uh, peace response. So, you know, we, we will discuss what Russia is like, but that's not, that's not the primary job that we have as communists. And there's still gonna be room, frankly, I think within our party, I, you know, by the end of this kind of discussion and debate, there's gonna be differences of opinion. It's not the sort of thing where we have to, where we're going to pass a resolution saying that everybody must take the position that Russia is this or Russia is that, or for that matter, that everybody must take the position that China is this or that. Just like, you know, you'll, you're going to find people with differences of opinion um, about, so, you know, some really important historical events, like what actually was the cause of the collapse of socialism in, in the Soviet Union. People who don't, dis people who disagree about the role of Stalin and so on. Like, we don't always have to agree about all these things. We do have to agree about what's the strategically important issues that are going forward. So I'm not telling people not to discuss these things, but to remember to discuss them in the way that's going to be most fruitful for how we can really clearly understand what our strategic role should be within the peace movement. So, okay, I'm gonna, uh, got several other hands up there. I'm gonna ask Ian next. Uh, I just wanted to briefly reply to what uh, Alex was saying um, is in the point point eight. Um, I think the point of uh, of that there, where it says the struggle between Russian communism and Western democracy is um, like obviously it's obviously not the case, and the it's saying like while well, nothing could be further from the truth. The, the purpose of that one is to not allow um, people to use a situation like that to criticize what we're trying to do as the as the communist party. And uh, I think that pops up a lot where uh, when people are trying to criticize a government, they will just say, oh, it's it's communist for whatever reason. And uh, I think it's important to the reason why that should be in there is to not allow people to use like a caricature to attack us and what we're trying to do. So maybe it could be worded better. But I think that the, the purpose of that point, I think, stands. Thanks, Ian. OK, Jason. Well, just on the last point that we brought up, it's actually something of a concern that we're sort of reviving Tagliati's polycentrism, the idea that Marxist Leninists or uh, Marxists can have a wide variety of different views on major international events. That, that I, I don't think we can should just, you know, throw that out there and accept that, okay, everyone has a different opinion. That's not a Marxist position. We should have universally consistent positions with Marxist parties on an international scale on major events like this. And when we don't, something is wrong somewhere with someone's views and, and we should be trying to identify what that is and who actually has the correct analysis of material reality. We shouldn't just 
say, okay, to each their own. That's, that's, I, I feel like that's not a Marxist way to approach some of these debates and splits. Okay, yeah, okay, good point. I'm gonna jump in to actually sort of talk about that because it's, it's, it's true that, you know, if there are two different, if there are two different points of view about what's something that's going on in the world, at least one of them must be wrong, right? Like, but it's also, you know, it's, we're not looking for some kind of academic perfection. And for one thing, you're not gonna get, you know, universal agreement because if you even go and look at what has been said by different communist parties around the world, they're not unanimous. Right? That this, you know, the, the, the hope of, of unanimity, of complete agreement entirely in the, in, you know, the whole global communist movement is just simply an unrealistic expectation. What we're looking for is what are really the what's what are the most important points like what where do we need to, we really need to be agreed where we really need to act as in a united way on the things that are the most important that are the most strategically important for our political work and there are there are areas of, of you know there are interesting and important topics where we have to just frankly admit we don't have the resources we don't have enormous you know numbers of people involved in research bureaus to you know to carefully look into all sorts of questions and some of the, you know some of our work is going to have to be um, we focus on what's really most important the questions which we cannot yet decide for either um, you know, logistical reasons or resource reasons, or because they just haven't reached, they haven't become the issues that are the most significant for, for political work in Canada, you know, we'll set aside to another day. So, you know, well, we do, we need to agree on the things that are the most important, but we also have to have a clear idea in our minds about which are those most important things and which are the things that we can, that we, we can afford to just not take the time <laughs> to debate. Now, I'm not saying that this is not an important discussion. This is a very important discussion, but we should that we need to keep focused on how to make this discussion fruitful in terms of letting us letting us go out with the most clear cut and united point of view on what slogans we should be putting forward in the more general peace movement in a way which is going to be most effective at uniting the peace forces in Canada. So, okay, I got I see Helen's hand is up next. Thank you. Ah, oh, very good uh, discussion, comrades. Um, I think you all made good point. However, in my opinion, you know, um, this country right now is at a very critical uh, time. Um, the economic uh, situation here is not good. The working condition, living condition of working Canadians are all deteriorating at a rapid uh, speed. And um, is uh, another uh, concern that I have is it looks like the um, the right wing uh, forces and the white supremacists seem to be <laughs> addressing these uh, issues. Well, we don't have any uh, practical solutions, so that really concerns me. So my my point is we should focus on the uh, the condition of working Canadians, especially those who struggle the most and address their concerns and figure out a way to mobilize them. But in one word, we, rather than, uh, of course, it's important to make assessment of the general international situation, the national situation, um, but more important to come on agreement on some workable uh, solutions to the national issues that the majority Canadians are facing. That's just my uh, two cents. Thank you, comrades. I see Karine's hand up. Is that still or again? Oh, sorry, it's again. I put my mute on. I just want to respond to what Alex said. I think that number eight does identify what the real problem is. It's imperialism. But they're trying to say that you know, imperialism is trying to disguise what it's doing by putting all these different labels on things. Uh, any country which has any kind of centralized government that's trying to 
uh, not privatize everything is seems to be subject to attack like Libya and Syria. They're all uh, prime for war. And um, it's basically, you know, and but the label they'll put on it is they're not democratic or they've got some other problem there that, you know, a regime change. Um, they're just trying to disguise what it really is. And it, it really, the real problem is imperialism. It's the jockeying for markets. And um, I don't know, I think the article, I mean, the, the, the sentence does sort of say that, you know, they're just trying to label it with other things to disguise the fact that this is about imperialism. Okay. Okay, so again, I see there's a hand up at Ukrainian Center, is that again or still? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is Martin now would like okay. to talk. All right, Martin, go ahead. So, <clears throat> Yeah, I agree with Helen there. Uh, what she said, just focus on the things that will get you votes, <laughs> not the things that won't get you votes. I mean, last, what was it, November when the election was? I voted, I've never voted in my life. <laughs> in my life, I've never voted. I'm almost 67. And the reason is because I figured they're all the same. The one's as bad as the other, so it didn't matter who got in there. And you know, that goes as well for America. And that's why, you know, the Russians wouldn't interfere because no matter who's in, the, it doesn't matter. They still hate the Russians, you know? So uh, you've got to just focus on something that gets you uh, votes. Now, do I have the figures correct that? you had less than 1% of the vote. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So you've got, to make, you, you've got to really focus on the important things. And so I had a, a chance this morning just to look. I didn't go right to the end of that document you sent me, but there were a couple of things that sort of glaring things that stood out. Now, first of all, for people who don't read the the document, the word communism, when you think of it, immediately you think of uh, uh, Chairman Mao and Great Leap Forward and and, uh, and Stalin and things like that. So it, it's just a bad name. It could have been a better name, but you're not going to change the name. So you're, you're stuck with that. But in Alberta, if you want to shut down uh, the tar sands, I mean, there isn't anybody in Alberta that's going to vote for it. And uh, if you want to close all the pipelines, it's so that you're not releasing any uh, carbon into the atmosphere. Nobody's going to vote for you. You've got to, you know, I, I've lived in China for 20 years on and off. And I've seen what they do. I've, I've taken uh, university courses on studying them about, you know, their climate, what they're doing about climate and stuff but they do things in steps. And they don't just say, okay, next year we're, we're going uh, uh, full electric, but Guangzhou or uh, Shenzhen will all of a sudden, this year it's gonna be all electric taxis and buses, and the same as Beijing. And then they're building this huge uh, solar farm in, in the Xinjiang desert, and then they're, building hundreds or maybe thousands of these giant windmills on the sea. So bit by bit by bit, they're trying to uh, reduce coal emissions and things like that. And that's what you have to do is you have to go step by step. And uh, one of the things that I saw you had written there was uh, free transportation. Well. Even in China, you still pay for buses, but it's very cheap. You get on a bus, it's maybe 25 cents. But I can remember 25 years ago in Toronto, it was $4 to go two kilometers. And then you'd have to spend another $4 to go the two kilometers back when you're done. Well, you know, there's two people, uh, that's $16. So something's wrong there, but you don't have to make these big jumps like you, like I saw, you know, reading, written in there. But something that Germany does, your, your stuff about NATO and NORAD 
and reducing, uh, you know, stop, don't buy these fighters and reducing military expenditures, 75%. Great idea from what I could see. But um, Germany is, I think it might be the only country in the world, I'm not sure, but post-secondary education is free. And it's even free for uh, uh, non-Germans if, if they go to, if they get a visa to, to go and go to school there. But of course they'd have to be able to speak German in order to understand what was being said. So some of that money that you're saving, you know, on the military infrastructure, you can put it towards education. So if anybody loses their particular job, whatever they have, they can say, well, I'm going to go back to Nate and it's not going to cost me anything. Because if you look at the tuition costs plus the housing costs, uh, most people can't afford that, you know, to, to go back to school for two years or something. But uh, yeah, that's my two cents anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Helen, is that, again, is that Still or again? Sorry, I forgot to uh, lower my hand. Sorry. Okay. okay. So, all right. All right. Anybody else? There's. We still. We've got lots of time and not quite a few people here who haven't actually said anything yet. So, so you know, certainly I want to like open it up that you know people can throw in their two cents worth. You don't have to be a party member because. As I said, this is an important period of time for us to have, uh, you know, a really broad discussion that our delegates go to the convention, really understanding as much as they can about, you know, what they expect the political uh, process to be in Canada over the next few years. So, Ian, is that you again? Uh, yeah. So this is a, a totally different point. Um, so uh, throughout the document, there's um, a lot of obviously a lot of claims, a lot of stats. Um, and, but the, there's only a few uh, sources used in it. Um, and my issue isn't with the, with that. It's um, so for the point number one, there's a, um, the references to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which is of course a you know, very famous group of scientists that have the, you know, their metaphorical doomsday clock that they, uh, they update. Um, but uh, I guess my, my issue is that it, it also is a publication of just regular, you know, writing articles and um, like typical kind of media stuff. And uh, they've been recently within the last year or two, a big uh, a propagator of uh, lab leak theories and kind of contributing to the uh, anti-China uh, kind of imperialist uh, narrative things that is not uh, strictly adherent to science. Lots of people have actually critici criticized their, uh, one of their popular articles that they published about the, the lab leak. Um, so while I understand that they've done lots of really good and useful work in the past and the metaphor is very helpful, I don't see why we should value that as a, a source that gets uh, linked right in our very first point if uh, some of the, their work is actually very counterproductive to what we wanna do, especially if the only other time uh, references and sources are used in the document are for things like Statistics Canada. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's not a, not a critical disagreement. I don't think that their, the doomsday clock is um, maybe it's just useful enough that it's worth keeping in there, but it's worth keeping in mind as well that um, the legitimacy of an institution like that can then also be used against us when they publish people like, uh, um, I believe it's uh, Nicholas Wade and uh, uh, some other things. So they've also published in things that are good on, on China as well. It's just, I, that is something I have read, read before and noticed right away when I looked at the document. Okay, uh, Salem? Uh, hi. So in uh, so with regards to like a uh, uh, domestic policies that uh, uh, might uh, might uh, like add appeal to the pile the party. Uh, I had a question about whether uh, there was any position on a, a universal basic income or UBI within the party because that's uh, that's something where there's been a lot of experiments done uh, not. Uh, not only in Canada, but all across the world. And most of them come to the same conclusion that, uh, you know, even if you pay people, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that people will stop working. People will still regardless uh, work, um, you know, just to make the extra income. 
So I was uh, just curious. Uh, I didn't see anything about it in the document, but maybe I missed it. Okay. All right. Well, we'll I think we'll, we'll circle about around back to that one later on. I think. So, um, okay. I see that there are a, um, there's a couple of qu things in the chat. I don't know. Like Adam, are you able to to actually speak, or did do? Were you only able to print this out? Uh, that was just the entirety of my comment there. Uh -huh. I didn't really have much to add, so I didn't see a reason to wait. Oh, yeah. So, oh, okay, so Adam just said, I would like to disagree on the stance against free transit, which for someone like me would be a must. I agree fully with the point as written regarding transit. I cannot afford to move around my own city as it stands. Even a reduced transit cost would be too much. And then there's a question from Alex Roth. Um, so I think that we'll actually take Alex's question as a sort of something like that we'll circle around to again later on as well, because it's it's about China and I think it's not, you know, not strictly the, the most uh, germane to what we're discussing here tonight, but we will come back to it. So I'm going to uh, call on Dre's now at this point. Yeah, okay. So basically, I'm further down the document a little bit here. Um, line 122. Uh, it reads, this new Cold War atmosphere underscores the importance of demands to deeply cut military spending, to stop the purchase of fighter jets and warships, to repatriate Canadian troops and weapons. These demands are labeled anti-war, unpatriotic, despite the reality that peace negotiation would save the lives of civilians and soldiers, stop the destruction of cities, farms, food, and productive capacity, and prevent mass movement, movement of refugees. Funds diverted from war preparations to civilian spending would create jobs, raise living standards, stop climate change, strengthen social programs, and expand public services. Now, I don't disagree with any of that. It's not, a more, it's not so much a disagreement, um, but maybe more about... Um, specificity perhaps like we say um funds diverted from war preparations the first part there to civilian spending would create jobs for example right the first part of that sentence in that particular section um do we have should we should perhaps it be a little more specified at, as in terms of a concrete example of how that might be done or is that just too much um verbiage for that particular section. Oh, I can't so I want to do that. Can you remind the line uh, us the line that it's on again? Yeah, 122. It's on page 23. It's very top of page 23. Well, I think let's kind of collect some of these these uh, d uh, points together rather than trying to just you know answer everything fully and you know kind of going going off in all directions a bit. So um, I see that uh, okay. Salem's hand is up. Is that again or still? No, uh, sorry, I didn't realize that to <laughs> unraise it. Oh, okay, so I know not. Okay, so I've got the Ukrainian center hand up again. Somebody else want to speak there? Yes, Chris would like to speak. It's yeah. a new point, so if anybody okay. wanted to comment on the point on 122, I would let them go first and come back to me, but I had a new point to start. Right. Can I just mention on 122, uh, we, can, we can discuss it, thanks to Drace for bringing it up, mm -hmm. but technically I, I, I thought we were only supposed to discuss up to what paragraph 118 in this meeting and then the next uh, half of the document at the next meeting, but, it, but the point has been risen, so we, we should discuss it, but back to Chris. Okay, Chris, go ahead. Uh, my point was on the uh, UBI actually from point 113 because 113 covers a range of 
topics that uh, are uh, issues that we could be organizing around. And so my point is on the uh, one that says enact a guaranteed annual livable income. I think this should be removed. Uh, universal basic incomes are at present a very popular idea in liberal circles for how we can go about lifting people out of poverty. While this is an amicable goal, we communists must not allow ourselves to be caught up in bourgeois fantasies. A UBI would first of all be incredibly costly to the state and has traditionally been postulated not as an addition to universal social programs, but rather as an alternative to them. Enacting a UBI will place us further along the path of the bourgeois party successfully making their case. The making cuts to our social programs and expanding privatization are necessary to undo the harms of irresponsible government spending. They will likely argue that a UBI would put power in the hands of households to choose their providers of healthcare and education, yet we would see prices rise and quality fall as capital conquers the carcass of our social safety net. It is also unlikely that any of the major bourgeois parties would ever support a truly universal basic income. Just as they are unwilling to provide dental care without means testing or other restrictions or limitations, uh, so instead we would likely see a conditional basic income which would surely follow in the great tradition of Canadian social programs of leaving the most impoverished and marginalized people out in the cold while they actually while actually providing as little public service as they possibly can. In creating a UBI, we also make the working class dependent upon the bourgeois state. Their livelihoods would depend not upon their ability to supply or withhold labor to or from the capitalist class, but upon the well-being of the capitalist state and ultimately the capitalist class itself. It does not liberate the workers from their wage slavery, but rather it tends to make them into docile subjects. It is a policy of class collaboration that would require the furthering of the hyper-exploitation of the working class abroad, in order to sustain the heightened conditions of the domestic working class while also guaranteeing the bourgeois class receives still ever greater profits. Furthermore, it is most likely that landlords, grocers, internet and telephone service providers, etc., will adjust their prices and supply in order to soak up these funds and leave workers in much the same position as they were before the introduction of a guaranteed annual level income. This policy is one that would benefit the bourgeoisie at every turn and one way or another will weaken the working class and must therefore be opposed by Canada's party of socialism. In its stead, I would make the case for adding the following as potential gains and concession that we could organize around. First, eliminating any legal distinctions between part-time and full-time employees, requiring employers to provide all workers with any benefits or perks currently restricted to full-time employees. Second, making any time work over 32 hours a week overtime. Third, increase of overtime rate from one and a half to two times regular pay. Four, an increase of the minimum wage to $25 an hour. As at 32 hours a week, this would yield the same income as a $20 per hour minimum wage at a 40 hour work week. And five, a guarantee of four weeks paid vacation and two weeks of paid sick. That was my comment. May I address that, Naomi? Sure, I, go ahead, Alex. Yeah. I think many of those additional reforms are what the party calls for. The 25, I don't know what the minimum wage we call for right now. Is it, I think, I think it is $25, $23 an hour. Okay. The, the point about guaranteed livable income or UBI, I guess, is, is very fair. You know, it is, it is a scheme promoted by capitalists, neoliberal capitalists. But I think the key point here is that it is included within all these other reforms. You know, it, if, it, if, it is an, if it is a demand by itself, it is subject to exactly all those criticisms you've leveled. But if it is included within all these other demands for public housing, for uh, pension reform, uh, increasing pensions, et cetera, et cetera, then uh, uh, calls to increase uh, public services and, and welfare state services, you know, then it, then it is, it is uh, those criticisms don't apply, I think, in that case. I, I think that just to disagree, I, I think that it still remains. Like, I, I think when we look at, like, I think um, school vouchers in Alberta are a great example with um, the public but not public school, whatever they're called, uh, charter schools. Um, you see the conservative argument is always, oh, you get to choose what you want. And yet it's still suffering from all the same issues of just direct privatization. It's higher cost, it's lower quality, and it's less accessible to people. And I think that because it's not us making these laws, it is not likely to ever be us in the next five, 10 years making these laws. These are concessions we're trying to force out of a liberal conservative coalition NDP liberal government. You're going to result, get, you're always going to be getting from them 
you know, little like snippets, little corners cut, little tricks put in there to make sure it doesn't go to everyone, to make sure there are rules in place. And I think it is harder for them to do that to something like a direct shortening of the working week, to, to a direct um, improvement of conditions in the workplace, whereas this is creating a program that is going to be used to attack other programs down the road. Conservatives will look at this as a reason to cut other social programs saying, people get you know X money in their bank account every month, they can go pay for their own health insurance. They can go pay for bus tickets. They can go pay for this and that, all the while you know, expecting the government to keep up all the time with you know price controls. For example, if you're trying to keep you know any any business from raising its prices to just absorb this, most likely landlords is the typical kind of thing people bring up. You're going to have just a lot more red tape, which is just more fuel to kind of the conservative arguments against. I just think it's ultimately kind of going to put the working class in a weaker position, no matter how we spin it. It always plays to the advantage of the bourgeoisie and very rarely yields something actually better in the long term for the working class. Okay. Okay. Um, next, I've got Corrine and then Helen again. Corrine? Well, I feel that um, it's still necessary to fight for housing because no matter what we do uh, in regard to a basic income, that's still going to be an issue. You won't be able to use whatever basic income you've got if housing costs are sky, you know, sky high. We still have to keep working conditions under, you know, improved. But there is a huge cost in gatekeepers forking out little bits of money to people. You know, who qualifies for pension, who qualifies for disability, who qualifies for welfare. That's a lot of money we're spending. And uh, there's savings there if we just gave people a basic income. And um, also all the money we put into policing, those people that can't get into, you know, get, get anything out there. That's a lot of expense that we're, we're spending. Uh, so I think um, there's savings there in the um, gatekeeper part department. Okay, Helen? Helen, if you wanted to speak again, you're still muted. Yes, okay, so I have difficulty to unmute myself. Okay, thank you. Um, I, as a, I, I don't know if the party has done anything regarding the uh, welfare system, but as a social worker by profession who works in, within the uh, welfare system, I personally believe the welfare system in Canada will collapse. And it's actually, this is just my personal opinion from my personal observation as a person who works within the system, is collapsing. So does the party, is the party aware of this? Uh, does the, has the party done some research and on this subject? And as we, I think it's critically important to understand uh, how the impact the wealth have on working Canadians, particularly uh, the poor who already struggle due to you know, these issues we are all aware. And the, some of the strategies we can apply to address those issues and at, at least use these issues to, to make a point for socialism and to build a, a mass movement, mobilize the Canadian workers to join us. Do we have something like that? Do, have we, is, there, is there any mentioning at all in our uh, convention documents? I think it's critically important to address this important issue. Okay, Jeremy. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I echo that point um, with Helen. Actually, I, I, in my working life, uh, Helen and I talk on a num number of different client issues as well as we're working together with, within the welfare system. But um, one, one thing I, I, I wanna emphasize with the, with the collapse of the, of the of the social welfare system that I, th I think we're witnessing the, the early stages of has, has been the increased um, 
you know, like the, these, these uh, like Alberta Works and Asian Alberta have been really following policies to the T on, um, on, on what people are eligible for, how people can get into Aish or, or, or Alberta Works. Um, what we're also seeing is um, uh, like a, a growing number of people falling into these um, social net programs. Um, a lot of people who are, who are disabled already coming into this pandemic, um, when CERB was available, a lot of folks access CERB as well as their social welfare without having any kind of financial education on that, any kind of talks about the consequences of how that could affect their, them being audited in tax seasons. And so what are we seeing? We, we see um, people who, who are already maybe homeless or, or marginalized in the community um, accessing this without the knowledge of, of how it would impact them down the road and getting struck with a, like a, a $25,000, $30,000 bill by the federal government to pay this money back. And, um, you know, as a consequence of them taking that money, their entire social welfare is taken away from them. So they're the first to be audited when, when, uh, when we're looking at austerity budgets coming into place. Um, and um, how, how, that, how does that impact on the ultra wealthy, you know, or, or the capitalist class in Canada? Well, they're not audited at all. They're, they're given the free reins to, to, you know, price fix and, you know, you know, run down organizing at job sites and everything like that. Um, so I, I do think more needs to be done. There is a little bit talked in one, I know one, one, 107, oh, sorry, 106, talking about the issues of the CWS in comparison to CERB, um, and um, I, I think it, I think we need to consider like like looking at the 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 um, the early stages. I think of 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 you know because uh, welfare systems are provincially um, legislated, but but I think across the board in Canada we're feel, feel, seeing a, a greater strain and um, a, a tightening of the rope for for especially the disabled in this country to access just basic um, income to survive. So thanks. Okay. Um, so again, I see the hand up at the Ukrainian center. Is that, <laughs> is that again or still? Yeah, just yes, a... Martin would like to speak. Okay, yeah. okay go I'll ahead, Martin. A, a quick uh, uh, comment on the, on the uh, what, what did you call the, the where everybody gets the minimum or universal basic income? Universal basic income. So if you're in a country like Sweden or somewhere, a very small country, very high tax as well, you know, they might be able to do something like that. One of the physical aspects of Canada is it is enormous country. You know, it's almost as big as Russia or I don't even it might even be bigger than Russia, but it was, it was smaller than the Soviet Union. But you've got a service, you've got a huge debt you've got to pay every month servicing all these communities everywhere in, in Canada, which you don't have in little countries like Sweden or these other uh, Nordic countries that like that sort of stuff. And the first thing you got to do is get elected before you start off on these, you know, climbing Mount Everest and this and that. And, you know, if, you, if you're offering a people, you know, a huge uh, minimum wage and, and a huge uh, paid vacation, you're not gonna get the votes. But if you just go with a more reasonable approach, then you'll get elected. And then once you're in, uh, once you're in the government, then you can start, you know, moving towards targets that you'd like to see. But if you just try to jump in all, you know, the deep end right off the bat, you won't get into Ottawa. So that's my, again, my observation. James? Um, yeah, I just kind of want to address that point. I've got some questions myself. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I don't. I, I, for, I forget your name. The Ukrainian Center there. I, I apologize. Um, what? What? The gentleman is speaking. <laughs> I, I don't remember. Art. Martin. Martin. Oh, Martin. Martin. Okay. Right. Sorry. Sorry, Martin. Thank you. Um, yeah. So you're saying like big minimum wage. I mean, I don't think anyone's 
I don't think anyone's asking for a big minimum wage. I mean, it, it people are asking for a living wage, wage that a wage that is above uh, the poverty line. And I think that's a very populist issue, right? Um, and I think people would actually win votes, win support. For I mean, you're going to lose support in some sectors. Yes, of course, right? You're going to have the, uh, the, the bourgeois and their supporters and the far, the far right. Even some of the far right actually will support this, this measure um, because it's in their economic interest to, to have a, a wage where they're not worried about where their next meal is coming from, to keep a roof for their head. Um, so, I mean, I, don't, I think that is actually an, elect, an elections issue that is electable rather than not electable, if that makes sense. I don't know. I mean, that's just my two cents on it. Um, I, I'll just give up the floor now and let someone else maybe say something. Well, I'll, I'll jump in here and say something about that, which is that we get the argument that it's just not workable, we can't afford it, the whole economy would collapse. Every time there's even the slightest um, suggestion to re raise the minimum wage by even the paltriest amount, right? Like they trot out the same argument for a $12 minimum wage that they would trot out for a $23 minimum wage. So we can't so we, there's just the only way we can avoid, um, you know, being criticized by right wing um, economic theorists who are actually acting in bad faith is if we never say anything at all and we just give up the fight entirely. Well, we're not going to do that. Right? So, um, you know, these are these are because they would work economically not because people already have agreed with us. If people had agreed with us already, uh, well, you know, what would, we wouldn't need to be having this debate about having, you know, adopting a, a resolution for the Communist Party. We'd have communism already, right? <laughs> so we know that it's a fight to, to, we have to fight for these ideas. So, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not downplaying the, the um, you know, the, the possibility that you could have, you could be just ask, you know, you could just be putting forward things that are just unrealistic. But I don't think it's unrealistic to go for a twenty-three dollar minimum wage. I mean, good heavens, it, that's oh, that's just the poverty line in Canada. The reason we picked twenty-three dollars was because like that was the poverty line in the most expensive city, you know, in the in the country. And you know. What about, you know, well, well, let's take it out of the, let's take it out of that military budget. Let's take it out of the taxes that the multi-billionaires are not paying. You know, like, we're, we don't have to put these questions forward as isolated individual demands, where it has to stand or fall on its own, as if it would be the only thing that was changing. We're putting forward a um, what we hope is an integrated program where all the aspects of it would work together. And so we always have to be looking at as well at, you know, that there are, that there's a great deal of wealth in the country that could, that should be put to work for social purposes rather than being siphoned off more and more to, to private uh, pro profits. Right? We know there, there, basically there's two, you know, there's two lines of, of uh, economic policy. There's the increasing, you know, the increasing um, inequality, the increasing uh, super profits of the multinational corporations, the increased funneling of government funding towards those corporations and the guarantee of the profits. Or there's the redistribution towards working people in the form of either their wages or the social services that are paid for by the state. And the, you know, that the question of wh what that wealth should be used for and who controls it is our main question. I mean, this is our case for socialism. So making the case for uh, social reforms that where the, 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 maxim, the, the maximum benefit could only arise under socialism is not an argument against it, to my mind, it's an argument for it. That makes it a good, a good demand because it makes the case for socialism. Okay, so 
I see Jason. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I can go with a general criticism of the party in general is that I think we appeal far too much and far too hard towards labor aristocrats within Canada. And I think I would prefer to have fewer votes and a less successful party that maintains a correct, coherent international line with the international proletariat than one that makes apologia and exceptions and promises for labor aristocrats that they'll have an even better life under communism uh, when it may not entirely be the case. Uh, the labor aristocracy, like, I don't think we, come to power by appealing to labor aristocrats and getting their votes, I think we need to challenge labor aristocrats. And as the imperialist system collapses, the views that we stood hard on become more and more valid. I don't think, uh, you know, we're, we're not here to uphold or defend imperialism. And uh, I, I'd rather have a correct international line and less immediate support within Canada than have, you know, betray the international proletariat to appeal to, labor aristocracy here at home. Okay. Okay, so there's hand up at the Ukrainian Center. I'm not sure who who would there wanted to speak next. Yes, As Chris would like to address Alex Roth's comment. He asks, is the marketization of basic needs a feasible plan as opposed to something as corruptible as UBI? Chris would like to answer that. Yeah, and I just wanted to kind of talk like I I I like the idea of demarketization. I'm a communist. I want to no markets anyway. I want everything to be free access. But um, I think that if that was to be done, you would need like a vast like you need essentially complete socialization of whatever it is you want to demarketize. Because if it's housing, for example, we've talked about you know you would need for there to be you know you need for there not to be an exchange between a landlord and a tenant. You would need for it to just be access to a social good and that is a really long term i think kind of process that would be you know a gradual building towards it would be kind of the government buying out housing socializing housing and then controlling rents down and down and down until the point that it can be fully integrated to a social system i don't think um it's something that can be put on the terms of a like an immediate political program or a um, like it's on the it's on the matter of decades, not uh, not years. I think demarketization as a goal. Except that, in fact, it has been one of our um, you know election platform items, and you know which we keep coming back to, of building a, a million units of social housing in Canada. So in fact, we are approaching. You know, we are making suggestions right away for it. You know, we it 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 hasn't been described as demarketization of basic needs. But in effect, what we're saying is build so much social housing that it's going to impact uh, also the market forces. So, so you know, it, it's the, we, the approach that we have, in fact, taken so far is not either or. We're putting forward all kinds of, of um, well, actually, it's, it's kind of like throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? <laughs> we, we put forward short-term proposals we put forward long-term proposals. We put forward small-scale reforms. We put forward sweeping reforms. We put forward things that could be accomplished, you know, right away. Things that couldn't be accomplished without, you know, you know, a really big advance towards socialism. So, in terms of what we put forward as, you know, our practical suggestions, they don't have to all fall into one category. Um, in term, when, when we come to actually discuss the strategies of which, you know, what's going to be our real priority campaign, what are we going to put most work into, who are we going to work, you know, which, which alliances are we going to work hardest to build, it, then those kinds of questions about what, you know, which, which thing is a prior, priority, which thing is doable now, become really important. But we do put forward a lot of ideas, you know, in, with the intention that these, these are ideas that we expect will come to fruition in the fullness of time. If we don't say it, nobody else is going to say it. We have to start the discussion. So, okay, I see Helen next. Okay, this time I could <laughs> mute myself easily. <laughs> I found there is a, um, a topic that is not raised by uh, 
by the party. Oh, I could be wrong. I think it's important to uh, not only uh, talk about uh, having welfare, redistribute the wealth. Of course, that's important too. But also socialism is able to mobilize uh, Canadian workers to create wealth. Like I found there's a tremendous amount of talents that are uh, wasted because of capitalism. It's important to uh, make people aware that Canadian talents are very much underutilized. If we can use fully utilize the Canadian talent and skills, we are able to increase the uh, overall amount of wealth in this country, which will benefit uh, the people. Okay. okay, then Corinne. Corinne, your hand is up, but you are muted. I'm trying to click, I keep clicking and it wouldn't go. <laughs> okay. Um, I was reacting to Jason's thing about uh, international proletariat. And I think the greatest way we approach that is to stop funding the military like we are. We back up all the exploitation through mining companies with our military around the world. But I don't think that, I think what we have for labor aristocracy in Canada is becoming, is shrinking incredibly. Um, we don't have the ability for one person really to support an entire family on one income anymore. We used to be able to do that because of uh, a labor aristocracy, but that's not the case. I don't think so much anymore. It's shrinking drastically. We have a lot of people in this country that need some lifting up. It's getting quite uh, tight for them and quite difficult. So I think in terms of international proletariat, we go for the military and raise up everybody. Okay. Uh, all right, anybody else? I don't see any hands up right now. I just what's also like running through the chat. Are there any points that were in the chat that we haven't uh, talked about? Uh, okay, so, See, hand up again at the Ukrainian Center. Okay, whoever it is there, go ahead. There's three of us here, so yeah. cut us some slack. Yeah, I'd like well, to no, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, the discussion on uh, universal basic income has been very good. We could have a longer discussion on this and, and educational on it even. Mm -hmm. And then even a larger discussion on the question of reforms and the relation, how to, how to, uh, how to uh, call for reforms that are more... Uh, uh, that are less reversible, let's say, than uh, otherwise, and then how to tie reforms to revolution, of course. But the points I'd like to make here are just smaller points on other parts of the of the document that I don't think have been addressed so far. This the section on the more international section later on solidarity with Cuba, uh, starting in paragraph sixty five. I just think it, sh it should be, the title should be extended solidarity with Cuba and the peoples of the world because it deals with not just Cuba. So we can, the, the section shouldn't just be titled on Cuba. And in paragraph 69, I'd like to see it, this, the paragraph 69 talking about the problem of refugees, the tremendous problem of refugees. I'd like something specifically said there about the specifically the refugees from Africa across the Mediterranean into Europe. Uh, the situation, a very terrible situation, as we know, with thousands of deaths, and the situation was caused, provoked by uh, the war in Libya. So I, I think that's that that should be uh, brought out in that paragraph. And then later on, I, I was, the economic section on economic crisis. The next section I think is really excellent and speaks to speaks to many of the points we've raised here tonight. In the next following section, the political situation in Canada, at the at the towards the end of the section, it does mention the Liberal NDP pact. But I think earlier on, I think it should have been mentioned. Like in paragraph eighty nine, it could have been mentioned, and uh, in paragraph one hundred nine, it could have been mentioned. It's finally mentioned, I think, uh, at the end of the section. But I think earlier, as soon as it's we start talking about the NDP in the political section, right away, we should have mentioned that the NDP has made this pact with the Liberal Party. 
so which which um, which uh, shows the tailism of the NDP in relationship to the Liberal Party, you can say. So those are only the relatively relatively large of my relatively small points that I'd like to address. Okay. Okay. So, uh, see any more hands up? Uh, I don't know. Okay. So, okay. So. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll remind you again, Karmas, that we do have the convention, pre-convention bulletins, which are produced, you know, to be produced in English and French, and, you know, transmitted to all party members. So all these various points which have been raised, right, I mean, uh, I noticed, for example, Chris has already done some work to put his, you know, to put his into writing. These are all, you know, these are the kinds of things that you can actually also submit to the pre-convention discussion. Uh, so whether it's what things that you've said here, or if some of the questions here have given rise to some thoughts that you think you can address some of these questions here and, you know, like move the, move the debate forward, bring, you know, uh, make, just so that we all have a more sophisticated, sophisticated understanding of a lot of these questions that we've been asking about and debating. It's a good idea to, uh, you know, send, send in your submissions to the convention, pre-convention bulletins. And uh, you don't have to wait for, a, you know, a later meeting where we're going to discuss a later part of the document. You can do that anytime now. Okay. Uh, so I see, is, there, there's, is this a, a hand up again or still for the Ukrainian Center? Oh, yes, Chris has a, has another point he'd like to address. Uh, okay. Very short in comparison to the other two. So, <laughs> okay. Um, it was an, on, on another one of the points from 113. Uh, there's the um, issue uh, of rollback prices and enact price controls on food, fuel, and housing. I think this could be expanded on just a little bit. Uh, I think Canada needs to set itself um, to ensuring not only generally lower prices, but consistent prices across the country. I think that this should be done through price controls and I think creation for crown corporations and public stores um, that are able to ensure communities needs to be met where private business is unwilling to offer a fair price on goods and services would be good. Um, I think this would do a great deal to improve the standards of living in rural and isolated communities, particularly those located in Canada's northern territories. That's the whole point. Which kind of stores? Anything from grocery to gas. I, like if, 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 you know, if, because I all I remember is the first time looking at somebody's like sending like somebody tweeted out a picture of like a basic like fruit bowl in the Northwest Territories and it costs like seventy dollars and that's just kind of how yeah. prices work up there. The only thing is, if you have something that's far cheaper, nobody will buy. Nobody will go to that other store. Nobody will go to business. Good. Frankly, good. It should there should only be public stores. That's <laughs> Or co-ops, we could call for something or co-ops co as a transition. Kind of drastic. You're going to put a lot of people out of business. The communist it's party, you. we are for a, we're a drastic party. <laughs> <laughs> we're a communist well, party, I'm, I'm we're not reformists, we're not social democrats, we're communists. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Uh, don't see any more hands up right now at the moment. Anybody else? Uh, have I have I missed any sort of substantive things in the the uh, chat? I think we might circle back. In fact, to some uh, you know a couple of points I said that we we wouldn't really talk about yet because um, uh, you know I I I, I wanted us to to try to stay focused on the sort of beginning part of this document as much as possible, but um, I can't even remember now who it was. Somebody raised the question about China's long-term plan, right? Like how, you know, China has a sort of like a hundred year plan to achieve communism, not a short-term plan. And, you know, whether that is still the, uh, the um, you know, their perspective, I'm, I'm still scrolling back here through here, trying to find that. Does anybody have anything they want to say about that? Jason has his hand raised, Naomi. Oh, okay. Jason, go ahead. 
Yes, and I actually think this kind of ties into something. It's not on the program, but maybe it's something that should be discussed. I mean, it's not urgent or immediate, but it's the way Marxists correctly understand things in the world is with the methodology of historical materialism. We understand the line of how the thing existed in the past and trace that line forward to the future. And when you understand that line, you understand how the thing exists in the world today. That's historical materialism. In order to understand the Chinese Communist Party as it exists in the present, we should do a proper and thorough and full investigation of what this party is and its history, uh, especially the Cultural Revolution, because that's the series of events that define how that party exists in the present. And I think our party should conduct its own investigation into the Cultural Revolution at some point so that we can reach an actual clear definitive conclusion about what the modern iteration of the Communist Party of China is and whether or not their intent is socialism or if they capitalist voters are still on the capitalist road. Okay. Uh, Helen? Um, you know, uh, I think I have some uh, <laughs> more information maybe <laughs> about China. Um, there, there are some cultural differences, right? Like in, I, I could be wrong, please criticize me. But, but I think from the Western perspective, uh, the Westerners, they want to believe that they, they, they want to find some kind of a, a universal truth. But in China, you, you never have that universal truth. It's a process. It's a, an effort to reach that point. So the same principle applies to socialism. There's no, there's never been any perfect socialist venues, but it's a long process to build socialism. So China is very uh, um, practical and objective by uh, labeling itself as the, the first stage of socialism. I think that's rather objective. Um, I think there, there are a lot of imperfections in that country. However, China is moving forward toward socialism. And China is the most promising country in building socialism uh, for now and in the foreseeable future. That's just my opinion. Uh, okay, I'd like to um, just interject here for a moment, sort of changing the subject a bit. I'm going to, uh, th th received an email today uh, announcing a May Day event, which has been organized primarily by our party comrades in Ontario. So it, but there will be, it will, it will be an online event. And so I'm going to send, I'm going to forward that email out over the next couple of days to all our members and contacts and i i would like to urge you know comrades to all attend that if they possibly can because um you know there are some some pretty um high powered speakers involved in that uh that event so although it's it's primarily i believe uh centered on uh ontario and ontario issues it is also the case that it is, uh, you know, that they're that they're having a uh, um, international, uh, you know, discussion and international speakers. So um, the most important one being VJ Prasad, who's really like a, you know, like a, a really high-powered speaker on an on an international level. Um, so uh, please look, watch out for that email coming, and if we. I hope we will also get some more updates about what's coming up for May Day activities locally in, in Edmonton and other centers in Alberta as well. So we will keep you informed as, uh, as much as we can about what's coming up there. So I see hand up again at the Ukrainian Center. Yes, um, I think Martin wants to talk about China maybe or Martin. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if, if there's anybody that wants to learn about China, that they don't have to send a delegation there. This is an excellent course offered free online from Harvard University. I took it in December. And it starts, you know, back in the 60s and, and it it 
teaches you the evolution of China right up to present day. And they give case studies of, of uh, different companies now that are world-class companies, but they started back in, in 19, I forget what it was, 65 or 70, uh, when the only companies were government companies. And yet this guy, he was on the outskirts of Shanghai, managed to get this little uh, company started that sold tractor parts. And now it's the biggest um, uh, car part uh, supplier in the world, pretty much. So uh, they go through all different uh, aspects of, of uh, China. So if you want to learn about it, uh, just go online. It's called edX, E-D with a big X. And it's from Harvard, it's free. And it doesn't take that long, but it's uh, some very interesting uh, stuff. Now, if, if you want a certificate from that course, then you have to pay a little bit of money. It's not very much, but- uh, To be certified you, China expert. <laughs> Well, not an expert, but you know, I just had an interest, and I was uh, in an oil camp sitting there with nothing to do, so I took it online. Excellent. Okay. So, okay, we we haven't quite come to the end, but we're coming up on two hours here, and when I. I don't know about the rest of you, my attention does somewhat start to flag. So just gonna ask one more time, does anybody else wants to say anything? Um, there are some people who haven't, you know, really haven't spoken here yet. Does anybody have any points they wanna bring up about anything that's been talked about here or any other aspects of the first part of this document? It's, just, it's really intended to be an open-ended discussion for uh, you know, whatever's on your mind. I, I've, I've tried to take some notes here about the various things that people have said. I think we will follow up, you know, there, there have been some themes that have arisen and where people have had some differences of opinion. So obviously, you know, there are some topics that, that would be fruitful for further discussion and debate. And uh, so we won't, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to forget the, what, what people have said here. You know, we will, we will be guided by what people are interested in, in what we think is important to discuss and have educational uh, and practical discussions about. But also, again, I do urge you know, all the, the party members to, to submit written submissions to the pre-convention discussion uh, so that you're, you know, think about what's been said here, take it further, you know, amplify on it and uh, you know, come up with, try to be concise because we're asking for uh, 800 words maximum submissions, but in, you know, you can say it a lot in 800 words if you thought about it ahead of time. So hopefully, um, you know, that some, we'll see some of the, you know, people attending this meeting today who will appear in the next issue of that pre-convention bulletin. And you can send those in at any time. There's no, you know, up until uh, the deadline, I think is finally um, June 20th, I believe. So there's, you know, uh, there's time to think about things, reread re -read the, the first section of the document as well. Like in light of this discussion we've had, I think you'll find, you know, it, it, it will help to um, adjust, you know, you, you'll, you'll, you'll go back and read some of those paragraphs and see where, see where you think they can be improved, or you may decide that they're good enough as they stand, <laughs> depending on, you know, how you interpret this discussion we've had here. So um, this is, a work in, prog in progress. And we will be having uh, at least one more additional meeting to discuss the, the uh, latter parts of the document. And hopefully more than that, hopefully we will be able to have time between now and the convention for further discussion. And as I said, we will be having our provincial um, nominating meeting where we will formalize uh, you know, the, the votes for, for delegates to the convention We'll, where we will nominate people uh, to be elected to the Central Committee, and where we will discuss and um, you know pass like to have have votes on resolutions that we want to put forward to the convention, whether it's resolutions that are intended to amend this document we're discussing, or um, 
resolutions of some other form. So, so uh, um, unless anybody has any anything further to say on that, I think you know we'll we'll uh, probably have another one of these in say in a probably in about four weeks. If anyone has any, if anyone has any real problems with Monday night as a meeting time, please let me know because we will, you know, we don't want to restrict this only to those who are able to attend on a Monday night. So, uh, uh, if not, I'll just I'll say uh, thank you, and hopefully we'll be talking with everybody again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, comrades. Everybody. See and you. So, thank you. Have a good night. Yeah. Thank so, you. Martin, it had been my intention to actually be there, but things got hectic, so I didn't have time to travel. So, I yeah, I wonder why you're. But actually, you know, hopefully we'll, we can actually kind of get together for coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, right now, I'm, I got a lot of free time. Okay. Right. Okay. So, I'll call you separately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. The, Naomi, can I say I didn't bring it up at the meeting, but my my main point of contention, as I said, I'd like to change change. I'd like to challenge the the suggested regional distribution of CC members. Oh yeah, I I think I would like. I would let, well, I, we can discuss it at the club level. We can discuss it at the Alberta Convention. I'd like it to be an Alberta resolution. I would like to, to make the CC more representative regionally. So I would like Alberta to have three CC members instead of two. I think BC should be reduced from six. If it's according to population, BC would be reduced to four, but I suggest BC be reduced to five. I accept that Manitoba received two, have two, which is more than they deserve in terms of population. <laughs> Same with the Maritimes, I accept that they have more than they deserve. But I also think Quebec should be given an increased seat given population from five to six. And so I would also say Ontario will be reduced by one. So basically I want Ontario and BC to be reduced by one and then Alberta and Quebec to be increased by one. Yeah, I agree with the increase part. Uh, <laughs> Well, the increase, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm prepared to make that. I'm going to, I'll write a, a, a longer argument for it. Yeah, sure. Okay. You can send that in. Um, yeah. This is the and, same and fight we're having it. in the YCL. <laughs> the West wants in. Is we do. Okay. It's true. So, uh, well, Alex, when you say by population, do you, are you referring to like just the population numbers of the people, the number of people who live in provinces? Or are you talking about the party membership. The Obviously, I don't know the party membership, so it has to be on based on population of uh, of, of Canada and population of the provinces. Because according, I did the calculations, and you know, BC uh, BC has thirteen point percent of the population, but has twenty percent of the of the CC members. Alberta has eleven percent of the population, but just under seven percent of the CC members, and so on and so forth. So uh, BC is over, Ontario is about, is correctly represented as it stands, and Quebec is almost correctly represented as it stands. I mean, Manitoba has only 1.37 million, Alberta has 4.37 million, but we're supposed to have equal numbers of CC seats. So that's a big... Alex, big there should be also a consideration of the membership increase, and we are expecting a greater increase of membership. So the uh, com central committee members should be uh, increased accordingly as well. So we can make a point from that perspective as well. Yeah, right. Well, it's the bird and the egg too. I mean, does does the does the larger number of CC member does the CC does the CC members reflect the sizes of the party in the different regions, or if we have more CC members from different regions, will that increase? The number of party members in those regions. Right? Yeah, the growth. I do believe. Oh, I do believe. I do believe that ma the Maritimes deserve greater over representation, and I'm, I accept that Manitoba deserves greater representation, and Quebec should have at least equal representation based on you know smaller sized communities deserve over representation on the on the CC. I think. Yeah, so we should take all these into considerations. The percentage. You know, membership increase, percentage rate of increase, 
those kinds of things. Yes, correct. Yeah. You could submit two resolutions, one uh, pertaining to directly the provincial population and one pertaining to membership numbers that could be debated more freely at the convention and decided there, and they could decide on some combination of the two or some system that they can work out. But I think it would be good to send forward, you know, any ideas about changes that should be made. Right. Yeah, good. Okay, good. Thanks for all your comments, feedbacks. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I'll, I'm going to say that I think what's likely to happen is, be, because we have been such a small party, that we've actually have been somewhat top heavy, like just the size of the central committee in proportion to the size of our whole party has been pretty large, <laughs> right? That as we grow, you know, that our general, our membership in general will probably grow faster than our central committee. So in some ways it means like that it, it's, it's that, that we become less top heavy, right? So that, but it also means, it actually means like that there's a, you know, the, the levels of leadership that have to be developed in between the central committee and the just the club level also have to be developed because effectively we've had no provincial level you know we've had no provincial committee in alberta for a long time there's quite a number of other parts of the country where that's you know it, it's the exception rather than the rule to have a provincial committee and you know so we what i think we you know just in terms of what's practical and useful it's going to be more important to build up the low level and middle level cadre and leadership, you know, let people have their develop their skills and their experience at those levels, the more local level, and work up gradually towards, um, you know, the the countrywide level. So, to your first point there, there, Naomi, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't propose an increase in the size of the CC. That's the easiest answer to this to just mm -hmm. add more CC members, but. For the reasons you've you've said, I don't I don't propose that. I propose just a shuffle, a small shuffle, not a not an increase. Mm -hmm. Okay, but okay. Certainly, yeah. Send send in you know write it write it in, and that <laughs> good, yeah. it will probably generate debate. <laughs> yeah, good, excellent. Okay, okay, all right. So I all think right. that that's it for now. I think I'll say good night. Oh, and I I thanks. just. Uh, could I talk to uh, Alex for a second? It's on other business, but anyone else, it's not secret or anything. Yeah. Okay. okay uh, go ahead. Ahead. Yeah, okay. I got a call from uh, Padia today about using the hall yes. on, on uh, May 1st, Sunday afternoon during the day. It's a, a Sudanese community group. And I think that you know, I went ahead and said yes and set a price, very modest price, and we're going to, we'd like to take a thing, but there's nothing going on at the time and they want to use it during the day on uh, May the 1st, which is next Sunday. So I, I went ahead and said yes. She'll confirm with me whether they're going to do it. They'll be doing things in the basement bringing in food and so on but they'll do all the cleaning and they'll pay some money for it so not okay, as yeah, much those as were, we now those were my only questions if we needed to help set anything up or if, if what parts of the hall they needed so that's fine yeah that sounds good yeah, yeah i just wanted to let you know besides so that someone besides me and had you know about it okay and yeah thank you that's just, it's, uh, I'm just really busy because I've got all kinds of performances coming up and so on. So, okay, thanks. Okay, bye everyone. No, Jeremy. Yes. Jeremy, can you have you updated the uh, the poster yet? No, I, I'm still struggling making the event. Like, what I'm trying to do is give you a poster that's reflecting the YouTube event. That I'm trying to, and I haven't, I tried yesterday. I, I have a bit more time tonight to figure it out because I actually want to do broader, like, um, um, public publicization on the event with, um, with just a general YouTube that we could stream kind yeah. of link. But the can I disagree with you on this? Oh, okay. Yeah. What, what do you think about it? I think it's a good idea, but the problem is I already sent out the poster to so many people. 
Oh yeah, fair enough. That will cause confusion. That's what I'm afraid of. Well, the, it wouldn't cause confusion in the sense that if people access the Zoom link, they can still get in. If they access the YouTube link, they can still get in. Um, I, it would just be like a multi-streaming service we'd be we'd be using. So you think they can still use that uh, code? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the, that's the primary way we're doing the the meeting, and then the YouTube will just be more like put on you the Twitter page and all that stuff. So there are two channels. Yeah, yeah. Well, when when do you think you can uh... tonight? <laughs> I'm gonna work on it tonight and get this done because <laughs> I need to get it done. Thank you. I'm I'm sorry. I'm very pushy. I apologize. No, thank you. No, it 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 really brings things to my attention when people are. So it's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Because I get forget sometimes. Yeah, me too. Me too. And also the, the, the yeah work on this person <laughs> make me anxious. And then the the video and the picture, please. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Um. Work on the uh, poster first. This yes. is. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you. Okay. Well, take care. Well, have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, good, Alan. Good night. Oh, Bly. Yes. Um, you know what? Uh, we are we selected the second movie. Do you want to download also? What is the name of the movie? Uh, the well, I have to send it to you because it's in English. Some, okay. yeah, some some uh some Chinese people may not understand. Yeah. So I for I have one that is uh, with English and the Chinese subtitles. Well, I don't know. I, we're used to re reading subtitles here. Yeah. I, I would suggest that you favor the Chinese language for the sound, sound and then have subtitles. Yeah, so the one, the one I have, have uh, both subtitles, English and the Chinese. Great. Well, you send it to me and I'll, I'll try downloading it again. Yeah, but uh, the website is Chinese. That's the problem. The what? So, the what side is Chinese? The website. So the instruction is Chinese. Instruction. Oh. Yeah, but it's the second, the second uh, button from the left. That's the download. That's the download button. Oh, I'll phone you if I if I have problems. Okay. If you have problems, and uh, oh, blah. <laughs> uh, Naomi suggested to open to uh, organize a Chinese New Year celebration. What do you think about that? Okay, when is the Chinese New Year celebration? That's over half a year ahead. Okay, but, well that sounds like yeah. Yeah, okay. but my my plan is to uh, invite people from different nationalities for performance. For example, the Ukrainian dance, uh, yeah. Latin American dance, and some performers, Canadians. That would be very difficult. To get going we might want to sit and think about that and i, I really don't have time to work on it now I've, i i can work on that but do you think we can do you support it the, the the proposal well i don't know if i do because i don't know if it's going to be that practical to get the performers lined up and oh i can i can get a performance well, you don't some of them you know you know but we want to have a range of people but I, I really don't have time to talk about it now. I will think about it and, okay. and get back to you. I've, I'm, I've got to get to work on another project. I've, I've got a very busy week. Okay, sounds good. I'll talk to you next week then. Yeah. Sounds good. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Yeah, good night.